Hello and welcome to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. I'm Dino Verrilli, founder and CEO of Project Purple and the host of the Project Purple Podcast. And today we have another interview for you coming up with a very special guest after a few quick updates. As we record this episode, th- these are just phenomenal. These get better and better uh, every time I read these, but the Project Purple Podcast, this is wild, has surpassed over 100,000 downloads. That's amazing. Just to think like when we had this idea to start a podcast years ago that we would ever reach 100,000 downloads is just just really, really wild. So we want to thank all of our guests who have come on the Project Purple podcast for allowing us to share their journeys and to all of our listeners out there for listening and really sharing our podcast because we know many of you share all the great guests that we have on the podcast. So thank you so much for allowing us to do this and for making it what it has become. We're already through 2023 as we record this and guess what? We set another record. Uh, 2022 was our best year up until this year and 2023 has become our best year ever in terms of fundraising. So I just wanna thank everyone who has supported donated or participated in a Project Purple event in 2023 to make it our best year ever. We can't wait for 2024. And on that note, we've actually launched many of our 2024 marathon teams, which is so exciting. Uh, Here we are at the end of 23, and we've already launched many of our 24 teams. Other exciting news, we are back in the Boston Marathon as an official marathon charity partner. This now makes us an official charity partner of the five largest world marathons. Many of our other 2024 races will be launching very, very soon. Also on our virtual side, we are launching our Purple Patties virtual event, which is coming back for its fourth year. Uh, That will be launching very soon. And for those here in the Connecticut area, we are super excited to announce our second annual Charity Pickleball Classic. We just came off our, our first one in September, uh, excuse me, in November. Uh, with the success we had in November, we are bringing it back really fast on February 24th in Oxford, Connecticut. To learn more about all these great events, make sure to visit our website at projectpurple.org and make sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date on all things Project Purple. Without further ado, let's meet our special guest today coming to us all the way. Looks like it's sunny there. I know it's sunny here <laughs> in Connecticut. Eh, eh, yeah. 50 50. Uh, coming to us all the way from Michigan, pancreatic cancer survivor, Matthew Rosenblum. Welcome to the Project Purple Podcast, Matthew. Hey, Dino. Thanks for having me. So, I say some terms a lot here on the podcast, and one of them is full disclosure, which I gotta gotta kind of get away from because I feel like, right, like when you say that, like you're teeing it up that like you don't fully disclose some things beforehand, which is not the case. But right, we were we were playing kind of catch up before we hit record, just kind of going over things. And as I've said, I, I don't I don't typically do a lot of research on our guests um, for the most part. Some of them I will. So we've, we've had some authors on, so sometimes I got to read books in advance, and you get to know a little bit about, you know, what they're what they're coming on for. But typically with our survivors, I know that they're a survivor, um, but I try not to go down kind of the the journey of what they've experienced because I think that's kind of what's led to our podcast being so great is just this authenticity of like hearing the story. And as you and I were talking just before we, you know, we're getting to know each other, it's it's kind of like I always envision this podcast as like you and I just meeting at a pub or, you know, at a coffee shop and sitting down and you know meeting for the first time and we just happen to have a camera and mics <laughs> available to record that right and so um i came across your instagram recently and i'm not on social media a lot i like to use yeah. the term post and ghost um i i think like sometimes you can go down rabbit holes on social and i like kind of like pick and yeah. choose like the content you you bring into your world um, yeah. And a lot of my content is just focused on what we do here at Project Purple and, and supporting the pancreatic cancer community. And when I came across your page, I was like, kind of really like taken back a bit, one, because of your age, which we're going to talk about here in a second. And I don't want to give up too much of your story, but then also the the BRCA piece, you know, which is near and dear to my heart. So um, I know I've kind of teased a little bit of your story with that. I'm going to no, 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 
to you to kind of to share your journey um, with pancreatic cancer. And I'm excited to kind of hear it firsthand from you for the first time. So with that, yeah. the microphone and the video is yours, Matthew. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Um, and thanks for all of this. Um, I, when I was very sick, I was not involved. I had no involvement with any pancreatic cancer organization and no understanding of the institutional landscape and the organizational makeup and all the different names. And so since I guess moving from the, I, I, I will tell people I'm a cancer survivor, but if I say it to you in conversation, usually the way I say it is I went from actively dying to now passively dying. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer at 32 years old, which is roughly four decades younger than the average pancreatic cancer patient, or at least that we know of, um, right? Like uh, my, my background and training is in the social sciences. And sometimes I'm a little dubious of the statistics like uh, uh, regarding pancreatic cancer, because if on the one hand, we can't find or diagnose it in so many cases until it's so overwhelmingly bad that the person uh, passes away, then I'm not really, uh, I am not uh, confident in the, the durability of those statistics. But um, from what we know, I am four decades younger than the average patient. Um, and I am, as you noted, um, I'm a BRCA2, I guess the word is previvor. Um, uh, pancreatic cancer survivor and previvor of all of the other cancers associated with, uh, with bro being BRCA, uh, BRCA2 mutation carrier. Uh, my sister is also a mutation carrier. Um, and in fact, around the same time I had my Whipple, like two weeks later, I got on an airplane and flew to Florida because my sister, my little sister and mother of two was having a mastectomy, a double, a preventative, I think the word is prophylactic mastectomy. Correct. Um, our mother died of breast cancer at 56 years old. Um, but my sister and my mom have the same oncologist and we confirmed recently that my mother was not a BRCA2. She, she had no known genetic abnormalities. Um, but yeah, she died at 56. It was the first year I was living in Lexington, Kentucky at the time. It was the first year of my PhD program. Uh, my mom worked in... Um, she was a, a public health librarian. She worked in health literacy. Um, so uh, talking about health-related subjects is kind of uh, in, my, in my wheelhouse. I grew up around it. And while pancreatic cancer and breast cancer are not the same, right, like no cancer experience inside of a category or outside in the broader category is the same thing. I definitely have learned from other survivors um, and other per people living with uh, cancer how to make it through. And one of those is definitely my mom. Um, in Early 2021 at 32, I was diagnosed, well, I started experiencing symptoms for what at first I thought was a hangover. I'm going to be honest, it was like in the middle of COVID, I had just lost my job and moved to Durham, North Carolina to, I needed a place to land and my best friend, Ben, uh, needed uh, needed help with his business. They owned a, a bakery and they um, were having a, I guess, a surprise COVID baby. Uh, the third, they were having their third and it was just a hard time. 
Um, and I moved to North Carolina and, you know, it was rough. And the business closed by the end of the summer. And by November, they had moved on, right? Um, and, and so I was in a place where I had come to land in the middle of a pandemic. And I didn't, you know, I didn't really, at this point, I didn't really know anyone. To get back on my feet, I got this job at like a fancy, like as management in a fancy grocery store. I just needed to make some money, put some money together to get out of North Carolina and to go back to Kentucky, um, finish my doctorate. Um, at the time, I was in a long distance relationship and that person was back in Kentucky. And so that's, that's where I was trying to go. Um, and this was like, this started January, 2021. So not even that long ago. Um, but you know, it was COVID. I was by myself. It was very stressful. I honestly thought I was hungover. My, you know, you know, the song and dance. It's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, that to me, that like part of the Part of the survivor testimonial for pancreatic cancer is me talking about my my poop so much, but that's the nature of the thing, right? Uh, I was a GI when... GI issue then that kind of spurred this on. Oh yeah. I, uh, so also, and this is related to the pancreatic cancer thing. We can talk about it uh, later, but I also was diagnosed that. 25 with uh Crohn's disease oh, okay. so like bathroom changes are a thing I'm used to but like when you when there is a tumor pinching off your common bile duct and your body cannot get rid of bile in the accepted mm -hmm. fashion man that is that is a change that even even me with all of my medical anxiety and even I, oh, I only lasted two nights. Um, I know a lot of people don't experience the crazy itching that can sometimes come with uh, pancreatic cancer, but I really did. Um, and in some way, it was like related to like my sleeping habits. I, I read, I remember vaguely reading about this, but it was always the worst at night. And it was always the worst on the bottoms of my hands and the bottoms of my feet, which are two places that are so difficult to scratch. Yeah. And, you know, the first day I had like a little bit of a headache and my urine was dark and I was like, oh, well, you know, it was around New Year's. Yeah. I just, you know, I was, I, I thought I was hung over. And then the next day, the next night with the itching, I knew something was wrong. Um, and then there was a second night of the itching. I uh, kind of, that first night I was like, well, that was weird. Maybe that'll just go away. And you know, that's not how things work. Um, but I remember that second night in order to get to sleep, I turned the bathtub on as hot as it would go. And I just forced my hands and feet under there for as long as I could hold it. And I mean, talking about it now, it's crazy, right? It's yeah. like, that's, that's not something people should do. But um, I had no, I, I had no idea what was going on. I'd never heard of this. Finally, I told someone about it. Less than 48 hours, I told someone. Um, and, you know, I had, I'd only been in Durham for a few months. I hadn't gotten a, a, a GI yet. I hadn't even established like where, like who my regular doctor would be. Um, so I went to an urgent care and um, it was an urgent care affiliated with the big hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Um, and, you know, I love, I, I love uh, nurses and I, and I love, I've always had a good experience in urgent cares, but I will never forget this day. 
because I was terrified because I knew I had symptoms of jaw. I was, you know, my, I hadn't yet turned yellow. My skin yeah. wasn't yellow, but I remember because every, every, uh, 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 nurse practitioner, nurse doctor, and uh, me otherwise medical professional in Durham, North Carolina is the most startlingly beautiful person you'll ever see. I don't know, it just happens to be like that. So like, here I am, my like skin is itchy. I look horrible because I haven't slept in two nights and this beautiful woman is shining a light in my eyes. And she says, I don't know, do they look yellow to you? And I, I just snapped in that minute and I was like, I don't know, you have a, you have a flashlight in my eye. <laughs> you went to some kind of school. Can you tell me, are they yellow? Um, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm six feet tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. I got told growing up, I didn't look Jewish. And then I got pancreatic <laughs> cancer and it's like, you know, I'm jaundiced, but you don't look jaundiced, um, which, which is, uh, the second step on my road to how handsome people kept telling me I was during treatment, which is a whole other weird thing. Um, but, you know, she, she, we, we get over the, the flashlight and she orders some blood work and the blood work comes back and she calls me. Um, I will say that I have been blessed uh, that the hospital I re received care I received tremendously great care there. I always get my, my test results have always come back very promptly. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember her calling me on the phone and I didn't really understand, like she was referring to things like Billy Rubin and mm -hmm. AST, alkaline phosphate, other liver enzymes. And she was like, yours are, your, your liver enzymes are very elevated. Um, and I remember the discussion we had on the phone because the first thing she did was, because I had mentioned to her that I thought I was hungover. So she originally, she used that as kind of an entryway to then ask me if I was, a, well, gently, if I was an alcoholic, mm -hmm. right? She thought these symptoms were the result of a serotid liver. Mm -hmm. Turns out, we, we got past that. Um, and she was like, well, you need, I, I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I'm alone in this place. The pandemic is go. It's like prime pandemic. Um, and she tells me to go to the emergency room. So I, that it was, it was pretty late at this point. And you know, we, we all, we, people believe in like a common rationality. Like if things are wrong with you, of course, the reasonable, sensible person is going to rush to the doctor immediately. I have, I was the kid who's been, who, who punched dentists, right? Like I, when I tell you I have medical anxiety, it got to the point where my mom didn't take me to the doctor anymore. My dad had to take me to the doctor. Yeah. I've hit nurses, not as an adult, but like. Yeah, yeah, as little kids, I'm, yeah. I just didn't like going. I'm, I'm very, I have a tremendous amount of medical anxiety. So, and it was late. And honestly, after two nights of not sleeping, I was exhausted. And so I, I slept on it that night. Um, and then early, early, early that morning, I went to the emergency room and it was like, you know, it's a major uh, hospital in a, you know, a, a, in the research triangle, getting right. into the emergency room at the peak of COVID, you literally, you would have thought like, I was trying to cross an international border. <laughs> I yeah. honestly with like, like a nuclear weapon. Honestly, yeah. right? Like yeah. short yeah. of waving a white flag <laughs> as I approached the door, it was like it was like nothing I had ever seen before. My temperature was taken multiple times before I got in. They they put an IV in my arm, like right there in the like sterile hallway. I, I thought like. 
uh, Dustin Hoffman was going to be in this movie. Um, and they, I got a CT. I think I had an MRI. I had an ultrasound. Um, I had like the, an ultrasound of my stomach and I had an endoscopic ultrasound also. Um, an ultimate an ERCP, what they found was there was a stricture in my bile duct. Um, and they didn't know what was causing the stricture. They took brushings. There was a mm-hmm. biopsy situation. Um, and basically what they told me was they put a stent in my bile duct. There was a stricture there. They don't really know what the stricture is. But they sent me home feeling like, yeah, this could be a Crohn's related thing. This could be a gallstone related thing. There are all kinds of explanations, uh, and which there are, of, of, yeah. of swelling in your, your bile duct. Um, but I remember I was in the hospital for like two days. Um, I, I got out. I got some Chipotle. <laughs> I was so hungry at this point. Um, and I go home and I call my little sister. My, my mom is, is, is gone. My, I don't have a relationship with my father. I'm close with my little sister. And she, you know, she's a mom. She has two little boys. And I remember her. She's Googling my symptoms. My sister is, you know, she, she was in like full mom mode. And she Googles my symptoms and she was like, maybe you have pancreatic cancer. And I was like, Brittany, I remember like slapping the table. I'm like, do not put the evil eye on me like that. Just don't, don't, because I knew. I didn't know a lot about pancreatic cancer, but like word on the street was, or like, you know, the the handful of, of Grey's Anatomy episodes um, like I knew it wasn't good. Um, we had, my grandmother had a friend who I was actually close to because they lived in Jupiter where I grew up, um, Jupiter, Florida, right outside of West Palm beach. Um, and she died of pancreatic cancer when I was a teenager. And I remember them talking about it It was like, Oh, well, it was too late and the chemo really killed her. And it, it, and I remember, I loved Joni. It was like three, three months. So when my sister said that to me, I was like, oh my God, Brittany. No, it's not. These very smart doctors at this elite hospital told me probably you know, uh, like a, a gallstone thing or something to do with my Crohn's or whatever. So the brushings come back and there are, there are like irregularities, but they're not conclusive and no one seems to be very concerned. Um, and they suggest that I have my gallbladder taken out. And so... My, the GI, who ended up being like a very, she, they, and, and took very good care of me, referred me to a surgeon um, at that same hospital, and he took my gallbladder out, except I do remember there, he made me get an MRI before I had my gallbladder out. I remember because I had to drive from Durham to carry and it was a huge pain in the ass and it's not like there was a a smooth trajectory mm-hmm. to uh to having my gallbladder taken out he they heard my mom had had her gallbladder taken out mm-hmm. my uh father had had his gallbladder taken out and they were just like oh a gallbladder situation but there was that mri there was at least some understanding that things were not completely, or some inkling, some hint that things were not completely kosher. Um, but anyway, the the um, gallbladder situation gets taken care of, and I go to uh, Kentucky to see my then girlfriend and. A few nights 
I can feel itchiness in my hands and I can't tell like it's it's the closest thing that feeling is the closest thing to torture I've ever felt and you know my friends and I when we were teenage boys we were idiots we waterboarded each other and this was worse um and I got really freaked out and I go back to the, and I've had, they put a stent back in. There are like multi, it's hard, honestly, to keep track, but there were multiple ERCPs on both ends of this gallbladder removal. And finally, I have an appointment with the GI, the endoscopist, and the, the brushings, they keep coming back. They're either okay or I forget the the word the word they use in the radiology report whether it was abnormal but not I I don't really remember but we have I always tell this story not because I am interested in shaming this person or like harming the good name of the institution but I do think that if we are going to talk about a world without pancreatic cancer, then this part of the story is important. This person looked at me and said, well, you absolutely do not, you definitely do not have cancer. If you have cancer, I will roll over in my grave. I left. I called my girlfriend. I said, they still can't figure out what this is. But the person said, I definitely don't have cancer. And, you know, I am a sucker for uh, an elite medical uh, opinion, right? When, when uh, someone in, uh, I, I mean, I was an academic. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I am, if I... If a whole institution thinks you are smart and the institution is is uh, is fancy enough and well not known enough, that that can be a, a powerful uh, persuader. You know, not the not necessarily that it is at all the correct way to think about things. But when the smart person told me at the at the nice hospital that I definitely didn't have cancer, I felt pretty confident. Yeah. And then two hours later, I got a notification automatically on my MyChart app. And it was a long, you know, long form uh, a thing, but it said adenocarcinoma. Wow. And I didn't know what that word meant. And I remember Googling it. I knew it wasn't good. And I've said this before um, that cancer words sound like the bad guy from Star Wars. Sarcoma, adenocarcinoma, like, damn. Like, if you knew nothing about the Nazis, you could tell by the way they were dressed that, uh, that, 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 that they're the bad guys, right? The black boots, the skulls, yeah. the whole nine yards. Um, and, and that's kind of how I feel about cancer terminology. Uh, it's it's so abstract. Uh, either it's totally abstract, right? And the words have various meanings like round and survivor and previvor, or they're overtly terrifying, like adenocarcinoma. Um, and I was at work at the time. I was still working at that grocery store, trying to, uh, you know, put some money away so I could, I could get out of there. And no one called me for about two hours. In fact, the case, because of what they found, got referred back to the surgeon who did my gallbladder, gallbladder. operation because he turned out to be, it so happens that he was the, you know, when you look up Whipple and they say, make sure someone who knows what the hell they're doing does the surgery. He was like one of those guys. Yeah. Um, so he calls me and, and God bless him. He calls me on his, he's away. He calls me on his personal cell phone, right? Within two hours of like, you know, I, I don't imagine that it was like, 
top of his list at the time, right? He had things going on. I, I'm surprised he even knew. Um, but he calls me and he tells me that he tells me that it he tries to put my mind at ease. There is still no 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 one has ever except for my little sister, who I to, do totally blame for this. No one has said, no one has used the word pancreatic cancer. Their assumption was that, I, and I know this to be true, because if they had thought pancreatic cancer, someone would have said it. Mm -hmm. um, but they very obviously thought I had ampullary cancer. Even though that is also very rare. Yeah. I had a buddy, and this is an off-color thing he said, but he said to me, when I told him about ampullary cancer and he looked it up, he has a PhD in statistics, but he's got a foul mouth. And he said, damn, that is the same chance as like going to bed, not a little person and waking up a little person. And it's just like so, so, so earth shatteringly low, right? Yeah. If you go back and read my, my medical history on my chart now, it says suspected pancreatic yeah. or ampullary adenocarcinoma. But that is not what they said to me at the time. They very obviously were banking on this being ampullary cancer. Yeah. And so I would have a Whipple anyway, but my, survive, my chances of survival were much higher. Higher, yeah. The doctor definitely told me it, he said something like that. If this is a tumor, then it's like a very early stage situation. And in retrospect, a lot of what they told me to make me feel better did not make sense, right? If the cause is cancer in my ampulla evader and it's causing me to experience symptoms like I was experiencing then it seems like in the over that then conventional wisdom at least would suggest that it's not early stage. Mm. In any case, I understand that these people are one playing the numbers, although weirdly, and two trying to keep me from flipping out. I remember going to, you know, he told me, he said, he explained the surgery very vaguely, but he said, you're going to come to my office. Uh, in, and it was like three days. I was going to have my, my pre-surgery uh, meeting. I was going to have an EKG, a stress test. They were going to prepare me for what I needed to do before, how I needed to live after, all of that. Three days. And I remember, you know, I'm Googling uh, Whipple, although like I still, I, I knew from Grey's Anatomy that this is like a coveted surgery that's very difficult, coveted for medical students, very difficult right. to perform. And I didn't know this guy. He took out my gallbladder, but it's not like, I didn't know his first name, right? I didn't know if he was a good surgeon or not. I assume that a gallbladder surgery, a laparoscopic gall gallbladder, gallbladder surgery is not the most complicated thing in the world. So like we're having this meeting. I don't really know this guy. And he says, he says to me, he, I, I very sheepishly, but obviously I'm trying to get him to put me at ease. I'm trying to figure out if he's a good doctor, honestly. And he realizes it. And I swear my doc, my surgeon, he looks like Christopher Reeve's Superman. He's just like, I found out he played college football. He, he looks like he's never been sick a day in his life. I think he was standing with his arms crossed at one point and he was just like, oh, well, like I did multiple of these last week. I'll mm -hmm. do mu multiple this week. 
Um, I do them with a higher rate of success and a in a shorter time than anyone else at this hospital. And I was just like, okay, man, I just I needed to see you whip it out and put it on the table. I needed I needed that that confidence from you. Um, mm-hmm. I forget what his entire song and dance was, but it definitely made me feel confident that my pancreas was at least in the right hands. Um, yeah. And. A week after that was my surgery. Less than a week, maybe. So this is when you talk when timeline. I just want to kind of get mm-hmm. that straight here. So this all started this is, in that. So January. So this is what, like February or March? This this is now. They they tell me the the my chart app is April twenty seventh. Oh wow! April twenty seventh. The surgery, the, the, that, the, the, my Whipple is scheduled for early May. Uh, the turnaround is extremely quick. Yeah. Once, once, once we get our, our, our act together after the first four months of, well, maybe trying to figure it gall, out. Yeah. If the gallstone left your gallbladder, but yeah. then passed, maybe this is just re- once we got our acts together, everything happened very fast. Yeah, um, and and I think Matthew, part of the frustration, and I mean, I think like this is like such a a key point here that I just don't. I, I want our audience to make sure they understand here. I mean, like there's institutional issues which I I see we see every day, and the system is far from perfect and it's broken in my opinion in a lot of places. And regardless of whether it's a, a high level institution um high volume center like they make mistakes all the time people are human right and and i think that's like the big piece and i think there's something that uh and we're not trying to throw anyone under the bus here or anything but i i just think you have to be your biggest advocate like you're like to your point you know and and that you've been so you know profound and in, in, uh, stressing here but also you know and i think this is like an overreaching over you know an arching theme here you know being 32 like I, I think this is like a bigger problem within the medical community, and I don't know how we change this because oh, I've I said, think. well, yeah, I, I, I think there's ways. Like there's, you know, you probably have more experience in academia than I do, and I, and I think the the one challenge is like so doctors, and I always bring this up, and I'll use nutrition as an example. To get nutritional advice from a, an oncologist is like, you know, going to your mechanic and asking him to do, you know, an open heart surgery, like doesn't know. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and and they shouldn't know because that's not their job. Right. And I think part of this is like, so we're seeing this big shift and, you know, in the last, like, I mean, we've been doing this 13 years and we've been doing this podcast for, like I said, over six years. And just in the last like six months, I think I've interviewed more people under like 45 than I, than, you know, that I can count on, you know, two hands, you know, that are, that are going through this journey or have beat it and and are fighting it and surviving it. And I did reach out in the beginning of the year. And I wasn't the beginning years, like six months ago to one of the top researchers in the world. And I said, Hey, you do, you know, he's been on the podcast before. And I said, I have an alarming like intuition that there's just a lot of people getting sick with this disease. And there's a lot of people getting sick with a lot of cancers really young, recent, like in the last like year, we don't know why. Um, I, I, you know, the data doesn't lie. Right. Like the, you know, academics, like they look at data, right. Everything's driven <laughs> by data. So I guess my point in, in all this is like, I, I don't think like doctors like are trained in it. And I don't know how we we change that unless you have a good doctor that either has a lot of experience, has good intuition, but then also isn't going to like, you know, go to school, go to med school and just like stick to the data that says like, to your point, like four centuries, you know, too young. Right. Yeah. Like that. This is typically like your average age is like 69 to 72 is the age band. But that's not that's not accurate. Right. Like there's something happening or there's something to be said that. This disease is just so complex that 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 number just isn't right. And we've got to like we've got to think outside the box, I guess, is what I'm trying to say with these clinicians and like your GI guys, you know, they, I, I get it. They're like really good at what they do. 
And I, and I think, I think a lot of times it's like the nurses that are like more open-minded maybe because they're constantly, you know, a nurse is getting pulled here or there. You got to do this, got to do that. You know, they've got to really like juggle so many things and they got to be quick on their feet where right. doctors are so specialized and they just stay in that lane, which is good. Right. Like, I don't want to yeah. like say like, we want doctors that are just doing, you know, like they're doing whipples and he's the best whipple guy, but now he's got to do this other thing, you know, and yeah. take away from that expertise. So it's like a catch 22, right? So I, I, yeah. I think back to it though, and this is the power of sharing your journey, you know, is that uh, you have to advocate for yourself. And if you don't, you're screwed. Yeah. I I do think that, um, I, I think that the medical community in some ways suffers from a poverty of how they interpret data. Correct. Right. Um, and and I read a book by an anthropologist about cancer that I found very interesting. And in that book, um, the anthropologist talks, she uses, I think it's a she, they use a line that uh, it reminded me of something my oncologist, my, my surgeon told me after I was diagnosed, which was, remember that you're not the average. And when I think back on that, I think, yeah, I wish you had remembered that I wasn't the average before that because right. I found on social media this guy who was like younger than me with pancreatic cancer and there was a reel. And do you know who there was a picture of him with in that reel? My surgeon, which means that this surgeon knew of another case of a really yeah. young dude with pancreatic cancer that at best, I can tell if he's playing the numbers, he's like, man, the chances of me having two, two, two patients who are under the age of 40 with pancreatic cancer, when being under 40, your chance, it's like 0.6, for ev 0.6 people for every 100,000. So statistically, that's very unlikely. But we also, yeah, but I don't know if those, I don't know if those statistics are accurate, man. Like, I don't, I, I don't know either. I, I, I don't think Matt, Matthew, I think like, and I'm not trying to throw a conspiracy out here, but like, again, like the people, like I, we literally have had, I, I could off the top of my head, we've had eight patients on the podcast in the last six months, all under 40. Yeah. Like that. So, so you mean to tell, so that's like us. So I should play Powerball because like we're, hit, we're hitting the Powerball with, with pancreatic cancer here. So yeah. like, I, and that was my point to this researcher. And I don't know if anyone's done any deep dive. The other number, and, and you know, you're part of this is the survivor number, right? Like I know American cancers, and this is where I go back into the data. And I'm not like, listen, people here, this is, we're going down a little bit of a rabbit hole with data here, but yeah, I'm not saying that like the numbers aren't accurate. And I just, am I. I, and I just don't know. Like, I, I, I think this is impacting a lot of young people and there's just, and you know, these are the stories we need to kind of tell. And I think the questions we need to keep pushing for in academia and in research is like, what's going on here? And like, you know, because there was some, some reporting that this was happening in females, but right. I'm not seeing like, yeah, we, there are females that I'm aware of, but there's also many males that I'm aware of too, that, you know, have, have you know, beat this thing and, you know, have gone through this journey. So I'm not seeing like a higher correlation in females. I'm actually seeing it kind of 50, 50 in, in our experience. Yeah. yeah I, I, I just don't know where these numbers are coming from, I guess, when they, you know, when they look at and when you hear like, Hey, you're four generations too young to, to have this thing. My, I, I am not trying to undermine, uh, medical, uh expertise right because i am the benefit of so much medical expertise what i yeah. am saying is to your point a doctor getting uh, getting nutritional advice from your yeah. oncologist is <laughs> is is not great yeah. getting get getting um social science data and interpreting social science data is also not the purview of a doctor that right. does not qualify you. Uh, and and also, I will say that I think the way data um, 
constrains when we when we look at things in terms of of numbers always then we we miss a lot and all i'm saying is that there needs to be some more appreciation of the humanistic element if doctors are going to look at data and make decisions that impact people's lives right so they cut me open and to do this whipple and they find a tumor on my pancreas turns out that that is what was causing the the symptoms uh they find a tumor on my pancreas and either it had already i don't know what to phrase it by this time it had spread um yeah. or it had already spread back in january who knows but they sew me back up and i remember waking up and so you had the whipple you had the whipple surgery though uh, they uh, aborted whipple oh they aborted the whipple yeah because it had i i was considered metastatic so yeah. they sewed me back up and i remember waking up and they had me in this i don't know if this was on purpose but like I I could not see a TV, I could not see anything with a clock on it, and my bed was positioned really weird, and no one was talking to me at all. Like and I was, you know, I had just come out of major surgery. I was high as a kite. I'm surprised yeah. I wasn't like singing Sinatra songs or something. But like as the, finally a nurse comes in and she said, "Oh, well the doctors are they they had another surgery after yours and then i saw her her at her watch as she left and i did the and i was like oh this not enough time something is wrong and then my sister comes in and she is just i i know something is wrong now because she is crying and the doctor he and this is something I've talked about in another podcast. He, he puts his hand on my leg and he tells me what's going on. But I'm high because, you know, they they dope the you up drugs, with major yeah, surgery. All the drugs, yeah. Right? So like I'm I'm like I I knew what he was saying to me, but also because of the gown and the blanket his hand was on the inside of my thigh. He didn't know where he was putting his hand. So like the whole time I'm like that was Superman hitting on me, but also, <laughs> but also, I understood the gravity of what yeah. he said. But and I remember, and he was—you could tell. The reason I've never, I've never broken, I've never given anyone a hard time about some of the the things they have said to me that turned out to be false and say borderline irresponsible because this is a tricky disease and people are going to make mistakes. Cancer is weird and you don't know how to behave around people and people say the wrong things and everyone gets some grace from me. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets some grace from me. Um, I remember he said to me, he said, just don't forget you are not the average pancreatic cancer patient. He said, this is a mean cancer. I will not lie to you. It is a mean cancer, but you are young. You are comparatively healthy. And we also at this point suspected that I was a BRCA mutation carrier because I told him that my sister was. My mom wasn't who died of breast cancer, but that my sister was. And you hadn't done genetic testing to get your results up into, well, they do it when you come in, but it takes a while. Well, no, they hadn't done anything at this point. No. Well, but I am, you know, I'm, I come, I'm Jewish on both sides. Mm -hmm. So before my parents got married, they had genetic testing. My grandmother has a ge genetic disease associated mostly with Eastern European Jews called Goshen. Ashkenazi. 
Is yes. she Ashkenaz? So you're yeah. Ashkenazi. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Which well, is a high you know, prevalence of yeah. BRCA. I think it's like 50%, I think, in it's, the Ashkenazi it's a, it's Jewish pretty, population. Yeah, pretty high number. It's like your chances of having BRCA in the regular population, it's like one in 400. It's like one in 40 for Eastern European Jews. Yeah. In any case, because of my grandmother's history, because of the, the way Jewish philanthropy is kind of organized around Tay-Sachs, before mm-hmm. my parents got married, they had genetic testing. But this was 1986. We, we, didn't even, we didn't even know about BRCA until uh, the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, so... Um, when my mom got sick, she got tested. And I remember she didn't have it, but my sister got tested and she did have it. But at this point, you know, I I didn't really know what BRCA was. And I think part of the problem is, but it's, it's, it's a good thing and a bad thing. BRCA is marketed as a thing that causes breast cancer and ovarian cancer primarily. Correct. So many organizations, the BRCA organizations, breast and ovarian cancer, pardon this phrase, but it's their bread and butter. And I yeah. think to a certain extent, it gives the impression that BRCA is a breast cancer thing, an ovarian cancer thing. It's a woman's issue. It's not a man's issue. I th- that's what I thought. I thought at worst, even if I do am BRCA positive, maybe like the chances of me getting breast cancer are astronomically low. Yeah, statistically for males, it's like, you know, like what, like less than 1% or something like, I I don't even know that number, but I know it's relatively low, right? It's very low. Yeah, so So why worry about it? Right, that's, that was my thinking. There was no, there was no education, uh, you know, even from my mom, who was all about this stuff, that BRCA was a men's issue, really. I understood academically that men could get breast cancer, but like, the, it's so infrequent, but there was certainly no discussion of, um, of pancreatic cancer at all. And, and so at, up until that moment when he was like, ah, and you are probably, the chances are that you are BRCA2, you're a BRCA2 mutation carrier and tests confirmed that. Which is and, a positive thing though for pancreatic cancer. It um, is, yes. And, and you know, the, the thing going back to, you know, your point of the, the BRCA with breast, I mean, I, you know, you mentioned a couple of things here, but like the data, like everything's so data driven, right? In academia and in research and clearly like the breast cancer folks and kudos, like my mom's a two-time breast cancer survivor, Yeah, you know, have done an amazing job and yeah, they sold that man. Like remember, I mean, mean, this is going back 10 years ago, right? When Angelina Jolie, I think was like the most famous person in the world. They have, Mm -hmm. you know, BRCA2 and she had a double mastectomy and a reconstruction. And then, you know, women just were like running to their, their, you know, their clinicians to get tested and to just have doubles, right? Like plastic yeah. surgeons were loving it, right? Like their business was yeah. exploding because of this. And, you know, now that, that, that process, I think that, that mindset has kind of come back. Um, it was like this pendulum swing, but I think that again, my mom is alive. Um, she is bracket too as well. And I, I credit, you know, the breast cancer groups for doing that. Yeah. And I'm sure there's many other women, you know, that have also experienced like the positives of that. So, but the unfortunate piece is to like, to your point, like no one was really talking about these other cancers, you know, like no one's talking about colon cancer, you know, until the last couple of years, because of some celebrities, no one was talking about pancreatic, no one was talking about prostate cancer. No one was talking about melanoma, right? Right. But those cancers are all linked to BRCA, right? And you would yeah. think like everyone else would have got on board, but no one did. <laughs> yeah. The literally the the only organization that I have had an affiliation with as a patient, as a you know a, a, a patient seeking any any kind of anything, uh, has been. Uh, Sharsheret, the Jewish yeah. uh, 
uh, organization, Jewish women's organization for breast and ovarian cancer survivors. I don't want to give the impression that um, th- that the breast cancer world is 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 blind to, no, no. to these realities. What I'm trying to to highlight are my own ignorances um, and like the that 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 an image that a problematic image that i think persists in some areas of of the medical community um but that's one of the things my surgeon did say to me after my age and my comparative you know health and vigor or whatever he was like and you're probably a BRCA mutation carrier and if that's the case then there's a lot more we can do for you so you he, get the results how far after the surgery then? Oh, like that next week, seriously. Um, but uh, he sent, so my, my surgeon, and you know, it's kind of in their makeup to be very confident. He yeah. was like, I'm not telling you that this is all going to work out in your favor because it probably won't. But I think that maybe in a year, after a year of treatment, we can be here again and try this. And so then he directs me to an oncologist, refers me to an oncologist, and the oncologist comes to see me in the hospital, and he was not as confident. And after I bully it out of him, and I really did, my girlfriend and my sister, at the, my girlfriend at the time, my sister, they really, they really gave it to him. And he looked at me and he said, with treatment, if you are lucky, you have one to three good years left. I I had to be in the hospital because they cut me open uh, yeah. and I was so depressed. I ate, I ate chicken fingers for, I know you're, you're always like, you're, you're into running. You seem very uh, active. I ate chicken fingers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for seven days. The doctor oh. would try and change my meals and Good the protein. nurses, God bless their hearts. These nurses, they would change it back for me. And I watched Harry Potter. And seven days later, I got up. I left. Two weeks after that, I started full fear and ox. So I remember. You yeah. jump on full fear and ox pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and how did you tolerate full fear and ox? Because that's like the uh, kitchen sink of kitchen sinks. <laughs> I remember coming home from my first one. And, you know. The worst, the worst part of Fulfurinox is that you have to stay accessed, Correct, right? Yeah. With that thing in your chest and you have to carry the purse yeah, the around. Pump. Yeah, you take yeah, it around. Like in the dumb bag. And it, I hated that thing. Um, but I remember coming home from that first chemo, May 27th, 2021, sometime around there. So like the end of the month right? That aborted Whipple is right before that, it, you know, it's the beginning of May. And I come home and I'm like, okay, this isn't bad. And then I did, I, I, it just got worse. You know, the one thing, and a, a woman reached out to me, she looks about my age and she, you know, on one of these Facebook groups, she's starting full fear and ox and she's scared. And I don't know what to tell her, right? Because like, I can't, it, it, it sucks. It's, it is the hardest, that is the hardest, was the hardest part of my treatment. Fulfurinox is no joke. And so like, I want to give this person peace, but I also don't want to lie to them. And everyone mm-hmm. else is different. And I firmly believe that my experience, like I, I see other people, you know, you don't really, they keep you kind of sequestered, but I, I, I can tell because of the way they organize us spatially. I know my experience was a little easier than the 82 year old in the cubby hole next to me, right? I worked, by the way, I'm still working 40 hours a week at this time because I'm so terrified because I've been in survival mode for so long And I hadn't worked there for long enough to have FMLA at this point. So like, it's like PMLA. And I also know nothing about this stuff. 
So I am doing Fulfurinox every other Tuesday, and I am working on my feed as the front end manager of a grocery store, a fancy like artisanal grocery store while I do it. This is the end of May, uh, three months in, they do my first set of scans and the tumor has shrunk a little bit. Basically everything is the same. Three months after that, about September, I, I mean, I'm in full full Furinox mode. That day, I remember it was the first day, five months I made it, that um, I could not get out of a chair by myself. And I'm talking to my caregiver. Uh, my best friend moved from Senegal, where he worked in West Africa, to Durham. Um, and I remember telling him, I was like, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. I can't feel my legs. I can't stand up. Um, and we get to the hospital. We get to the, the doctor's office and I have my CT and I'm just dreading because after the CT is the appointment with my oncologist. And after that, they send you upstairs. I've mm -hmm. always been, no matter how bad things got, I was never turned away from chemo. I was always considered healthy enough. But that day I was terrified because it was starting to get like all that youth and vigor. Uh, the swagger had, had, had decreased quite, quite significantly. I, you know, at the beginning of this process, I was 215 pounds. I think at this point I weighed like 150 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and my doctor, my oncologist comes in and he says, bad news. Well, actually he doesn't say bad news. He says it in his weird, weird kind of around the, uh, around about kind of way. He said um, that my tumor had grown and that it had metastasized to my liver. Uh, there were two, at least two spots on my liver that they could see. And at this point I was really terrified because now I knew a little bit about pancreatic cancer. Uh, but before this, I knew something about liver cancer. And mm -hmm. I was just, I was like, this is how it's going to end. Like, I am going to die in this incredibly painful way. This is going to be horrible. And my doctor, who, by the way, and I'm not saying this to make fun of him. I'm saying this because I, uh, it, to, to get an inkling of the kind of patient I was, um, uh, I Googled him and it said that he graduated from medical school in 1978. And I said to him, you know, you're not in your best shape when you're, you're in these situations. I remember saying to him, I said, 1978? What did you do to people with pancreatic yeah. cancer in 1978? Did you just throw them right out the window? Did insurance cover it? And I'll never forget it because he looked back at me and he said, no. Insurance, I would never throw anyone out the window. Insurance, he didn't, he just like, he answered it earnestly. Yeah, he was, he didn't get the sarcasm. Him. Yeah, he is, he's not funny. He's not at all funny. He's maybe the least funny person I know, but he's been doing this for a long time. He's a thought leader in this field and he's an incredibly thoughtful person. And so that day, I got switched to a combination of gemcitabine, abraxine, and cisplatin. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, it's, I know all cancer is bad, all chemo sucks, but I was so thankful for, for this cocktail because compared to five months of Fulfirinox on my feet 40 hours a week, this was much, much more livable for me. The neuropathy was still bad, but I, I could basically exist as an independent person. 
sometimes the my nausea was bad, but for the most part, I can count. I, it's it's been almost three years. I I've maybe thrown up twenty times. Maybe that's that's generous. Um, my nausea was pretty bad, but thanks to my my stoner little sister, she would drive gummies up from uh, Florida because they were THC is mm-hmm. stupidly illegal in the South Carolina in South Carolina because it's backwards and because they can't figure out how to how to agree on a means to line their pockets with the profits yet. I I digress. Um, yeah. I, um, so they switch the chemo yeah. to the different cocktail. And so what right. happens from, so do you have a positive response from that? Oh, chemotherapy? Yeah. yeah. That's where I was going. Sorry. The, no, the no. chemo brain thing is, uh, it's, it's real. Um, yeah. The first scan I have, one of the spots on my liver disappeared and there was, and he, and my, my doctor, imagine you've done this since 1978. Imagine all the sad shit you've seen. Yeah. I've never seen him smile. He's never once laughed at a single one of my jokes. But that second scan, when the other spot on my liver disappeared, he smiled and he said, I think if there's one more scan like this, I'm going to suggest that you, that uh, Dr. Allen, uh, try the Whipple again. And that is what happened. March of, this is, this is 2022 at this point. Yeah. March of 2022, my oncologist, he, he sent me, that was the only time I got turned away from chemo was that day when he was like, yeah, you I don't think you need to do this. Let's give you a month to, you know, uh, rest and hang out and we'll try it again. Um, so I go back in for the Whipple now, second time yeah. in March of 22. Well, so no, how it's, it's it's actually it's May. Wow. So they give me a month. They give me April to celebrate my 33rd birthday and uh, to or my 34th birthday at this point. I, I don't remember. Um, I celebrate my birthday. I I eat everything in sight. I go from yeah. 165 pounds to like close to 200 um, in the span the of a month. Yeah. Uh, I, when I read about the Whipple, it was like, you know, you're going to lose a quarter of your body weight. Yeah. So I, I, obviously this is not the healthy way to do things. Don't try this at home. But like, I just ate everything and the great thing about my oncologist who uh, to your point earlier about nutrition i remember when my best friend asked him in the beginning of this journey he was like does he have to be on any special diet and at this point my oncologist thought i was cooked and i remember him saying no if he wants to eat it just let him eat it and that's really i don't i'm not trying to give nutrition advice I'm saying that in a very dark place, did I eat Burger King for 20 days in a row until my caretaker told me I won't take you to Burger King anymore? Absolutely. Um, I enjoyed every second of it when I thought it didn't matter. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I bulked up and I had a lot of fun and I traveled. I traveled during chemo too. I would fly back and forth between... Durham and Lexington, Kentucky. Um, I really did not like living in Durham and I missed Kentucky. Um, And that after my mom died, it became home. Um, So early May of 2022, almost one year to the day after they aborted Whipple, uh, literally like like within three days of a year, um, they uh attempted another whipple and it was a wild success um there was no evidence of metastatic disease outside of my pancreas and i forget how they described it but like colloquially 
at least my remember my surgeon saying that like the cells that they found in the tumor were like so we, I, I I'm pretty sure he said dead um 19 out of 19 uh lymph node tested lymph nodes tested uh negative and I have not had evidence of recurrent metastatic disease since in any of my every three month uh scans that's unbelievable so then yeah. do you do chemo post then do they put you back in just because of uh i know that's usually the protocol but like given what they find and okay so is that the protocol do you know, uh, one, I don't one know. I, I mean, I think some guys do and some guys don't. I don't know. I mean, it, I think it all varies from situation to situation. I, I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I, I've always kind of gone with like it, some people say that's the protocol is like, you know, chemo posts just to make sure everything's like. Yeah, zapped. that was so this was kind of my thinking. I remember the CT after my Whipple and I have the the appointment with my um my oncologist and he says well do you want to do you want to try some radiation and i was like so everything i've read up until that point suggested that radiation was not effective but yes. also if the site of the tumor is gone like what do you radiate if the premise is that after surgery there could be tiny little bits of cancer floating around in my body then like, it seems like let's just do chemo again. So I yeah. did after surgery that summer, after I had like, man, it's rough. I, I do not mean, I know I, uh, because of my age, it was not as hard for me, but it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Like retrain my body, how to eat, how to yeah. like digest food, incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult. Um, and I came up with all kinds of crazy hacks for that. But I remember going into the oncologist's office and being like, look, man, I am going to complain either way. This whole process has been uncomfortable and horrible. So let's just do some more chemo. And I, after they cut out a third of your stomach, at least in my case, chemo was much harder yeah oh shit it was hard it i did four i did two months four or yeah four uh treatments i think i only actually got through three before i i i just i couldn't Tapped take out. it anymore um yeah it was and and zofran and compazine and the anti-nausea meds they give yeah. you they really um they were not as um they were not as effective for me honestly and i i'm not trying to peddle anything that is illegal in your state but like yeah, yeah. i found a tremendous amount if you're gonna do chemo after after the whipple surgery i found that low thc but but thc gummies were yeah. incredibly effective to soothe my stomach um but yeah i did i did two months of chemo and then i did uh limparza and i've kind of yeah. been on and off of which is a digestive them di the digestive enzymes no lim limparza is a parp inhibitor oh the it's parp a, inhibitor yeah, you're right it's you're a right, you're right. oral yeah. chemo yeah yeah and ah uh, man i it's hard to be 35 and sick because it's like I'm I'm tired of it already. Yeah. I'm sick of it. I you know, I haven't I've been farting into the same couch cushion for three years. And sometimes I don't wanna, you know, take the the damn pills. Um yeah. but I do. Um I'm on a break now for the holidays, but um 
Yeah, so have your scan have your scans been clean? This is just kind of like routine maintenance, as we know with these genetic mutations. Yeah. So now you're not in Durham. So have you been? Did you switch care in terms not of yet. just geographic? So you're still being treated down in Durham with the yes, original but, group, right? But I'm not receiving like so. I get my pills from a pharmacy or in the yeah, mail, yeah, but yeah. I've been, so after I was no longer imminently dying, I shot my shot with a girl I knew from college. Um, I went through a horrible breakup in the middle of pancreatic cancer, um, but I was single for like the second half of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's a weird position to be in. You're single but you have this terminal illness and yeah. it, you know, it doesn't really make for a great online dating profile. In any case, once I was out of the woods, I shot my shot with a girl I knew from college and um, we've been together ever since. Uh, I moved to Nashville um, maybe four months after we started talking and we moved to uh uh michigan uh, michigan right after that you know it's sort of my i don't i i feel very uncomfortable with the inspirational moniker um and my sister explains to me that sometimes people don't know they're just trying to like say a nice thing to you and they might actually feel inspired by you i did a lot of things the wrong way I did a lot of things that you shouldn't do if you're going through pancreatic cancer, probably. But the one thing I do tell to people, because I, I believe it, is that you can go through the worst possible thing. And for me, this, this, this has been it. Pancreatic mm -hmm. cancer is no joke. Um, I went through the worst possible thing and I came out the other end and I found the best possible thing. And now I live with a woman I love and our, you know, little black pug, Monique. And it's not perfect, right? Like I still have pancreatic cancer breathing down my neck, but like there is, if you're, if you're lucky, and that's a horrible way to put it because it shouldn't be based around luck, but there are so many contributing factors that make it really sometimes a matter of luck. There, it is not, I hate the rhetoric of death sentence. Mm -hmm. I think when we consider pancreatic cancer, a death sentence, especially because it affects so many elderly people. That moniker can be incredibly disempowering, right? Sometimes I go to these survivor events and there are dudes in their 70s and it's like Jack LaLanne. Like, it's like, okay, you know, calm down, man. But like, uh, <laughs> and I'm afraid he's going to start lifting me. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but like Jack. pancreatic cancer, when, when you were diagnosed with something, it's not, it's not like life ends right there, right? Yeah. Like sometimes it does. And that's sad, but like you have a certain amount of time and you're going to go through treatment and you're still alive. You're still a person, right? Just because I looked like a skeleton didn't mean I wasn't a man. Right. Um, yeah. Well, well, you just say something. I mean, I think... Um... How do I put this and not try to offend a, a large probably part of the audience listening? Um, there's a thing of it. I feel like I've already done it. No, no, but, but this is what I want to say. Like, yeah, like the, pancreatic cancer is no joke. And you, you just, you know, shared your journey, which was a no joke experience at 32, 33. Like, I mean, 32, 33, you're worried, like you said, starting with getting career, a mortgage. You know, with friends. Yeah, like starting. You know, things that 33, you know, 30 to 35 people do, right? Being with a, uh, someone that you're, you're into and all that, you know, starting a life, not worried about cancer and in particular pancreatic cancer and the connotation that pancreatic cancer comes with. 
to your point, as a death sentence. And, you know, nothing is guaranteed in life, but to, to have that mind shift change, to realize like, hey, life still goes on um, and it, it kind of doesn't define you, kind of that ideology is just so powerful. And I get it. Like, this is very serious. And I, and I do think too, Matthew, though, like we talked about the breast cancer groups with BRCA and I always say like, we stay in our lane and this is kind of like why we do this podcast as well, you know, is to share this, this insightful knowledge that like, Hey, there is hope and it is, but it is serious. Right. But that doesn't define you. It doesn't dictate like what you're going to do in life. And that is so powerful, regardless of your age, regardless of, I think if you're 80 years old or 20 years old or 40 years old, like you control what you can control. Um, Cancer doesn't control that, you know, it may shift things a bit, but you still control what you do and how you do it. Um, And I think just during your journey here has, has been kind of a testament to that. I got a couple of questions here for you. As I mentioned before we hit record, sure. I do have questions. Yeah. One one that just came up. Did you ever think about going somewhere else, like getting a second opinion, given what you got, what you went through? No. I Why did not? not. Because if I'm being honest, I was not that committed to the idea of survival. And in retrospect, I wish I had been, I wish I had been one of those, like the old guys with the the track suits who are like at survivor events, like lifting yeah. ladies up on their shoulder, or whatever. But like, I was just not that positive. My friends all kind of coalesced around me. Mm-hmm. and really made me do this. They really pushed me along the way. But like, at a certain point, they had seen the tumor on my pancreas. This was a good hospital. It seemed like they had their stuff together. And the chances of me living, even with a second opinion, were so astronomically low that mm-hmm. I didn't want to bother with it. That's the honest answer. I was a single man with no children who had just basic, who had, whose doctor had told him he had one to three good years left. Mm-hmm. I was doing treatment at that point because it's my, I, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. I understood yeah. that. Yeah. I had nephews. I have a sister. I have people who loved me. So I did it. And I did what that doctor, what my doctor, what my medical team told me to. But was I trying, was I really out here trying to, you know, no, I wasn't because pancreatic cancer found me at a, you know, particular time of my life, in my life. I, I'm also, there's a, there's a touch of I'll dance with who brung me. Um, in me and Mm -hmm. what i like about the doctors i have is that can't pancreatic cancer in particular it's not just me and it's tricky like Mm -hmm. we didn't even know what the pancreas did until 200 years ago if that right so it isn't what I'm, I'm not looking for a doctor who knows everything, who's perfect, right? That, because that's a fantasy world. What I do respect tremendously about my care team is that along this nonlinear path, they have never given up and their, you know, the will or the will to go on and to think differently and to pick yourself up and persist is something they've demonstrated to me multiple times. And, you know, now, now that I'm only passively dying, it's, it's that kind of persistence that I find very inspirational. So no, I'm the idea that because I live in Michigan, I need, I do, Natalie will kill me if I don't. Like I need 
to move. There are fine hospitals up here, but yeah. I feel like almost guilty leaving them. Yeah, yeah. But you just said something really profound, though, this nonlinear path. And I, 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 no, I've never, like, who goes through a linear path, you know, other than what you read, right? The data, right? right? And that's the thing. I think that, again, we go back to the medical profession and kudos to the team there, right? Like that you saw that and, you know, um, I know, you know, you know, I think people just think like, okay, you're just going to go in and it's going to be textbook. Nothing is ever textbook with this disease, nothing whatsoever. But to have a team that's, that doesn't give up on you, man, that that's, that's insane to have. Right. And that's what every patient should have. And on that that same breath here you've brought up friends and you brought up your sister a lot and so i just want to spend a couple minutes here and, and talk about that because i know we've had many survivors on and they talk about how they don't do this alone and you you had such a crazy journey where they, like you landed in Durham to help your buddy and then that ended very quickly because of the pandemic and now you're all alone and i've been to Durham um, it, it, it's it doesn't have a great like transportation system. It's a big hub, like it's in that yeah. triangle. If you need to fly somewhere, yeah. Oh, it's great, right? But if you need public transportation, your SOL. I mean, there are city buses, but they're not that great. Um, yeah. It's not like a major urban center that has a subway, and and there's no like the Ubers are very like hit or miss. Um, taxis are like hit or miss. So it, it becomes yeah. a very difficult place to kind of, I, I feel like to get transportation to and from certain places, unless yeah. you have a car. Right. So you talk about like your buddy leaving West Africa and your sister. So what, what was it like to have friends and family as a support and just that you can share kind of with our audience? Yeah. I'm sure there's people listening and, and, and this is where I would say we go with this, Matthew is like a lot of times people want to be like, you said, hey, man, I'm six foot one, 215 pounds, three, 32 years old. And like, hey, I could conquer the world by myself. I don't need help. But then you get this pancreatic cancer. And like a lot of times I feel people don't ask for assistance or they don't know what to ask for. I, I have two thoughts. Um, one, people don't ask for assistance. And I certainly am guilty of that. But also caregivers sometimes people around you don't listen and that and that can be a tremendous problem especially right. for someone like me who gosh I, I, on the best of days i'm difficult but like you're telling me you're gonna put a three-fourths inch needle in my chest every two weeks that that to me, like, I, I knew I was going to be a prick through this thing. But um, my sister, when I was laying in the hospital, and as soon as it, my friend Network heard the news, it, like, spread like wildfire. And all of a sudden, my little sister, who we're not, we're not tremendously close. We're, we're in each other's lives. She's my little sister. I, it, you know, it's a weird relationship, but it's it's a brother-sister thing. I'm four years older than her. I remember her looking at me in the hospital bed and she laughs and she says, you have all these friends and they love you so much and I just do not understand it at all. <laughs> so basically what happened was my sister, two little ones, she lives in South Florida. I knew going down there was not an option. Her coming up to North Carolina, also not an option. So the one best friend who had brought me to Durham originally, he flew in when it was time to have my port put in. He flew in for that, but he has three kids of his own and was trying to build a new life and rebuild after COVID. And so my best friend who works as a digital cartographer, he makes maps, um, he was living in West Africa. He came to the United States to, with his wife to see me off through treatment and ultimately into death. Um, having a support system is important. Um, but think about what that support system looks like, what you want that support system to look like, 
and then make sure you have a conversation with the person who intends to be your caregiver. The problem in my situation, my, my um, you know, personality aside, is that what I said before about, you know, being sick, being a, like, it, it's, it saps your vitality and your agency, not as a matter of fact, but sometimes in the eyes of other people. And so it colors cancer. And, and, and we're not just talking about any kind of cancer. We're talking about the, the emperor of malignancies, right? That colors the way people see you. You're no longer, you're some people, and in some circumstances, you're no longer like a fully autonomous, the assumption is that, you know, you're so traumatized by the experience that like you're not thinking clearly. And in some yeah. cases, and on some subjects, that is true. But no one ever asked me what what did did I need? Do I want my best friend to move to uh, Durham to help see me off into death? And it's hard to talk about this because it's hard not to seem ungrateful. I am tremendously grateful for everything my friends did and sacrificed for me. But in hindsight, I wish that I had been given the respect that you would give any other adult. And instead of someone, I think my sister told me, well, Alex is moving here. Your friend is moving here. He's going to take care of you. If he had picked up the phone, and then I could have been like, I don't think this is a good idea. And then if he had persisted, we could have come to some understanding, yeah. right? But as it happened, he moved from West Africa with his wife, who I had met on one other occasion. And everyone concerned had a different image of what this would look like. The generosity of spirit and the ethics of care at work, in care work, in pancreatic cancer, in every other cancer is, man, if, if life gave out gold stars, that would deserve one or purple stars for that matter. Right. Um, but don't infantilize the person you're caring for. Remember that that person is an agent. They are a man, a woman, they are a person. And so do less to them and if you really want to do something for them, have a conversation, because at least as a practical matter, it's very important. Because I'm a private person. I remember, for example, the my my best friend's wife, tr like basically trying coming into my apartment, and I didn't really know this person, and I flipped yeah. out. I was sick and feel well, and suddenly. There's a person in my space because in her mind, that was appropriate yeah. because we never had a conversation. I wish I, I knew now, I, I knew then what I knew now because I would have insisted upon it. That's the, yeah, it's the advice I have. It's super powerful because I think there's two things like people assume and you should never assume, right? There's that. Uh, saying which yeah uh you assume you make an ass out of you and me and then I, I think the other thing and this happens often i'm not trying to make excuses here at all for anyone but i think people think like oh i'll go do this because that's what so-and-so needs but to your point which is so powerful they don't have that conversation they don't they don't they don't ask and people feel, and this is where we've heard a lot, like, have the conversation, be normal, right? We hear this thing normal, right? Like, it's normal. Like, if someone's going to come over and help, like, hey, Matthew, I'm going to come over and hang out. You know, I'm going to do this for you. Is that cool? Sure. Are you yeah. not, Hey, man, today's not a good day, man. Like, you know, it's just not good. I don't, I don't really want to see anyone. I don't know. I don't feel comfortable, right? Whatever the reasons are, right? But just to assume and just to come over and 
as well intended as that is, right? Those these are good intentions. It's just like there's there's the communication. There's no communication. And, yeah. and, you know, in a lot of situations, a lot of times in these in these tough situations, like I think we forget as human beings, like we still have to communicate, you know, and you still have to have those those hard conversations. And that's a hard conversation. A lot of people don't want to have hard conversations, but sometimes that's what leads to change and leads to progress. One um, of the biggest sort of related to this, um, one of the biggest experiences I've taken away from being, from my journey or whatever experience with pancreatic cancer is like, is saying sorry. Like mm -hmm. you will, you will lose parts of your body and you might lose your mind a little bit and that's okay. You might act in a way that you would not normally act, say things, that you might not normally say. And I have, I have certainly stepped in it. I've put my foot in my mouth. I, I've talked to people who I love and care about and respect in a way I would not normally speak to them. Mm -hmm. And in all of those instances, learning to, to, to apologize, you know, sometimes doesn't come easy. But I have found in my personal life that apology has come easier now and forgiveness for me also comes tremendously easier. I have a friend who basically ghosted me for the entirety of chemo, the entirety of treatment. And then when another friend of ours, after I was, you know, out of the woods, Another friend of ours is, he works, he's a map librarian for the Boston Public Library. And he sent me a text message. He was like, hey, if I send you a ticket, will you just come to Boston? We can celebrate you not dying. And I was well enough. And I'd been in the house for so long at this point that, yeah, you know, I, I take him up on the offer. So about a month after the Whipple, I fly to Boston. And this friend who hasn't spoken to me through the whole thing, he also lives in Boston. And he sends me a text that says, you know, it explains where his mind was. Mm -hmm. You don't know what people, even if they've never gone through pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And the cancer muggle, the, the person who's never gone through it can be super annoying. They can be, but there's no rule book. There's no, there's no nothing that explains to you how to be around this, uh, around this disease. And so people have treated me in ways that I don't appreciate, but like under the craziest circumstances. So I know in, in, in Hebrew and Yiddish, my, my bubby would say, you know, that I should have Rachmanis, that I should have sympathy for these mm -hmm. people. And I guess uh, in, in Christianity, it would be called grace. I yeah. try to give people grace mm -hmm. because this is very scary when you are literally the embodiment of death for some people, they're Correct. gonna act weird yeah. and you act weird. And as long as you can apologize and take responsibility for what you did, then I hope I find forgiveness with you and I, I endeavor to give that, in, that forgiveness back. Powerful. My last question here, and then we're gonna also, before we end this, we're gonna share with our audience where people can connect with you. But before yeah. we get there, and this is, uh, I always say loaded question. There's no right or wrong to it. Given your experience, your journey, how do you define the term pancreatic cancer, Matthew? This is like that question that they ask you, like before you're about to have major surgery, when it's like 4.30 in the morning and the like, the very beautiful nurse is like, can you describe in your own words what you're doing here? Um, gosh, I, for me, Pancreatic cancer has been an opportunity for me to learn to live again. And that's, 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know that I could uh, uh, define it any, any other way as a survivor. For me, when I think pancreatic cancer, I think not that Matt Rosenblum needed to get his groove back because the wonderful thing from my perspective is that you can go through a horrible thing and you can come out on the end. You're a little weird. It's like you went, you're like, not like you went to homeschool weird, but like, <laughs> you're going to be a little weird. Yeah. Um, but you can come out of it and you can learn to live again. I think we're all a little weird. Um, we just don't know <laughs> it. Um, yeah. And knowing is half the battle. Um, that is so profound. And uh there's no right or wrong to it. And that's the grace of all of this is like everyone's experience and journey is different. So your experiences and how you have dealt with it is you and you own that. Um, and that's powerful. So I appreciate you sharing that in definition with us. And, and Matthew, this has been great to have you here on the podcast. I mean, uh, you know, this is, uh, as you just summed it up, I mean, it's not anything that anyone ever goes into or it's like something you put on your resume, but we're all dealt stuff and how you deal with it and how you come out of it and how you become weird or realize that you're weird is really like where like it makes a difference. Um, and the difference I mean in that is like, you know, knowing that people on the other side listening or watching this, you know, going through that, remember that. Because I, I think this disease can be very lonely and daunting. And as we've talked a lot, like the statistics, like you're not a statistic. And I don't think a lot of people are a statistic, right? Um, because of just the data. But that's like why we do what we do here at Project Purple, to, to change that and to help that and to push you know, these stories along and to continue to raise awareness and, and bring this to the forefront. So you know, thank I you for for sharing that. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this tremendously. Like you said, the pancreatic cancer can be very lonely. And I personally regret not reaching out more when I was sick. I just wasn't in the, the headspace to do it, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for what you do here. Um, thank you. Thank you. For someone listening or watching, where's the best place if they want to reach out to you? Uh, maybe they live in Michigan. Maybe they are going through the similar journey that you went on and, and maybe have questions or maybe someone who's BRCA too, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and they also just got recently diagnosed. I, I know that's kind of, we call those kind of diamonds in the rough because, you know, there is a protocol that does well and, and there are people out there. And, and that's kind of one thing that's really exciting about the space in terms of the research. Like, I think, I feel genetics is kind of moving this thing faster than we all anticipated over the last like five years. But if someone wanted to to follow your journey or to connect with you, where's that place? Sure. Um, either Instagram at my funny pancreas. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if that doesn't work for you, you can find me on Facebook. It's just my name. Um, LinkedIn, just my name. Um, or you can send me an email at matthew.rosenblum439 at gmail.com. Awesome. Matthew, thank you for being a guest on the Project Purple podcast. Thanks so much, man. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. If you liked today's episode, please share this episode and follow the Project Purple Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. That's a wrap of another episode of the Project Purple Podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, please be safe.